Hello everyone and welcome to Boundless Dentistry. In this video, we will talk about molar incisor hypomineralization. Now, this topic is something, a disease, which is although rare, but we do encounter that in our dental practices. So in this video, we will talk about everything that is related to molar incisor hypomineralization. Clinical picture, if you can see, there are six pictures and this represents a clinical case. If you start focusing on incisors, as you can see, there are some opacities which are present over here, incisors. And also you can see that these molars, specifically the first molars, they have been decayed or you can say they are broken down. Also, you can appreciate in this picture as well, this is the first molar. And you can see there is a demarcation between this abnormal dental tissue and this normal dental tissue. So, what is molar incisor hypomineralization? It's a qualitative enamel defect which means that there is something wrong with the mineralization which normally occurs of incisors and molars specifically all of the incisors and permanent first molars so this pathology basically affects incisors and permanent first molars there is progressive hypermineralization because it depends whether the disease is mild moderate or severe so that will basically decide how much mineralization has been affected on the incisors and first molars now this disease is specifically associated with the incisors and permanent first molar so they can be opacities as you can see and in severe cases you can also appreciate how much this first molar has been decayed or you can say broken down now we move on towards what is the actual etiology which is responsible for molar incisor hypermineralization mainly the etiology remains unknown However, there are some etiological factors which are responsible for causing hypermineralization um, syndrome, which is molar inside the hypermineralization. For example, it is associated with asthma, dioxins, chicken pox in children who are less than three years old, problems in pregnancy, use of antibiotics, otitis media, which is the middle layer infection, upper respiratory tract infection, and lastly, pneumonia. These are some factors which are seen in the um, child and in uh, pregnant um, mother where these factors they play a role and which predisposes or you can say increases the chances of development of molar incisor hypermineralization. So these are all the etiological factors which are responsible for this pathology. In our dental practices, when we suspect that the patient might be suffering from molar incisor hypermineralization, what are the clinical features that we should look for or you can say signs and symptoms that we should look for in a patient who might be suffering from this pathology Mainly, this patient experiences hypersensitivity because enamel, intact enamel helps to reduce sensitivity that is experienced by the patient because sensitivity is not a pleasant sensation that the patient experiences. In this clinical pictures, you can appreciate that the incisors are affected, first molars are affected and you can see this first molar has been broken down. Since there is enamel has been broken down, so patient experiences hypersensitivity. And in these patients, there is difficulty to achieve anesthesia. For example, we are treating this first molar and when we'll try to go for inferior alveolar nerve block, there will be some difficulty in achieving local anesthesia. And you can also see that since there is enamel opacity that you can appreciate in these incisors and first molars as well, these give an unesthetic appearance to the patient's smile because of this discoloration which are present, mainly in the incisor because the aesthetic zone is when the patient smiles and mainly the incisor are visible as compared to the first molar sense. Now, since there is breakage of you can see enamels over here and opacities, this porous enamel can increase the chances of pulp inflammation and sensitivity. Other than that, since there is hypermineralization of these incisors and first molars as you can see, it will lead to weaker enamel, it will be prone to breakage as you can appreciate in this clinical pictures. And since there is no intact enamel present, so there will be difficulty when, for example, we are going for composite restoration because for composite restoration, the restoration binds to the tooth structure more favorably when enamel is present. And since these enamels are porous, they are very prone to breakage. So when occlusal load, even when the occlusal load is not that much, this will lead to breakage of the enamel. So these are the clinical features which we should keep in mind and the patient does report to us when they might possibly be suffering from molar incisor hypermineralization. Talk about clinical presentation in more detail as to what features do we look for in a patient 
from a dentist perspective in a patient who is actually suffering from molar incisor hypermineralization. Firstly, you can appreciate that there is this chalky enamel. You can see this is the normal enamel and there is this demarcation and there is this chalky enamel. So there will be discolored chalky enamel as you can appreciate in these clinical pictures as well. Next, since there is hypermineralization which means that this ena normal enamel is not properly mineralized so it can be easily chipped off under normal occlusal load or even less than that since it's weaker so it will be chipped off. Next, as you can also appreciate that the color of this enamel it's not the normal yellowish tint which is normally present in a normal enamel it can range from being white, yellow or brown as you can appreciate in this clinical pictures as well. Other than that, as I mentioned before, there is clear demarcation between the normal enamel and the enamel that has been affected because since there are various ages through which enamel is being um, hyper mineralized, for example, when a child is years of age, so incisal third is being mineralized, second year of age, then middle third and so on. So depends on which age the patient has actually started to suffer from this pathology. So that part of the enamel is affected. Next. As I've talked before, only the first permanent molars and incisors are affected in almost all of the cases as you can appreciate in this clinical picture as well. Incisors and first molar they are affected. Very rarely we encounter that second molar and bicuspid are also affected. So this is a patient, a clinical presentation of how patient actually presents to us and what are the features that we should keep in mind as you can also appreciate in this clinical pictures that we should keep in mind when we are actually looking and trying to diagnose whether the patient is actually suffering from molar incisor hypermineralization or not. Now, molar incisor hypermineralization, it varies in this severity. It can be mild, moderate or severe and the treatment plan varies whether it is mild, moderate or severe. So we'll talk about the severity of this MIH in more detail now. If a patient is suspected to suffer from mild MIH, there will be opacities in non-stress bearing areas. There will be no enamel caries because this disease is mild. It has not affected the teeth that much. Other than that, since there is not that much of enamel breakdown, so patient will not experience any hypersensitivity and only there will be mild involvement of incisor. As you can see, that there is this just one lesion which is present on the molar and this gives us an idea that the patient is actually suffering from mild MIH. Moving on, we have moderate MIH and in this case, there will be demarcation between the uh, opacities on incisor and molar that we saw in clinical uh, presentation. Other than that, you can also appreciate that there is now post eruptive enamel breakdown. As the tooth completely erupts in the oral cavity, there will be breakdown of the enamel even, even under normal occlusal load or even less than that. But there will be no cuspal involvement in moderate MIH. And since now there is some enamel breakdown, so patient will experience mild sensitivity. Moving on towards severe MIH. Now the post eruptive breakdown will be even more severe as you can see in this clinical picture. Patient will have a history that for example I have been suffering from um, a sensitivity for the past 3-4 years. So patient will give us a history of dental sensitivity. There will be crown destruction as you can see that there is almost destruction of large area of the crown and since incisors and molars are affected so patient will now report greater aesthetic concerns. So this is how we will grade mild, moderate, severe severities of MIH and we should keep this in mind because this will actually help us for a proper management plan for the patient. Now in our dental practices there are various pathologies which mimic each other so we should keep a differential diagnosis in mind. For example we are suspecting MIH but we have to rule out conditions such as dental caries, a normal dental caries. We have to rule out amelogenesis imperfecta and we rule out by having a proper family history. If a patient has a family history we can lean towards patient might be suffering from melogenesis imperfecta. Other than that, we have to keep in mind enamel hypoplasia as well and fluorosis. Now, how do we actually rule out the differential diagnosis condition? Because we have to know each pathology in detail separately. That is how we can rule out whether the patient is actually suffering from MIH or one of these dental conditions. Now, before we talk about how do we actually manage a patient who is suffering from MIH, we should keep in mind the ways of prevention because it says it is always said that prevention is better than cure. So what we can actually do that we can make sure that a patient decrease the chances of suffering from MIH 
we should know some prevention factors. For example, we have to identify the risk factors which we discussed in etiology that we have to uh, keep those etiology, etiological factors in mind so that we can prevent MIH. Other than that, we have to make sure to reach an early diagnosis because if we go for early diagnosis, we will go for less invasive treatment plan and success rate of those treatment plans is greater as compared to the treatment plan which are offered in the patient who suffer from severe MIH. Other than that, we have to go for therapies which will increase the chance of remineralization and decreasing the sensitivity of the patient, that is desensitization. Other than that, since there is enamel breakdown and since there is increased chance of bacterial ingress, we have to make sure that we prevent caries and doing all of these things, we have to maintain it. If we do not maintain it, then there is no use of actually treating that patient because if we do not maintain those results which we have achieved, it will further lead to deterioration of the already compromised dental structures of the patient. Lastly, talking about how do we actually manage a patient who is suffering from MIH. Now, firstly, we'll talk about how do we manage patients who are presenting to us with mild MIH. Firstly, the option that we can go for is fissure sealants. As you can see in this clinical picture, we have identified that the patient might have mild MIH. So we, what we can do is we can prescribe fissure sealants. Fissure sealants basically helps to decrease the chances of um, caries in that patient. As you can see, fissure sealants have been placed. Raisin infiltration is also another technique which helps to restore the, condition, the dental condition of the patient. Other than that, if we have condition where there is difficulty in isolation or tooth are partially erupted, they are not completely erupted in the oral cavity, so we can go for glass anomalous cement restoration, which is actually very helpful in such condition. How we will manage a patient who is presented to us with mild MIH. Now talking about moderate MIH, now in this case there is increased enamel breakdown. So when extensive areas are involved, there is increased chances of fracture. In moderate MIH where there is no enamel loss, we can treat it like mild MIH, but in cases of enamel loss, we can go for either composite or GIC restoration on the um, first molars and incisors that are involved. Sometimes we can also go for amalgam restoration, but these amalgam restorations should be reserved when there is no severe involvement of the teeth. In less severe affected areas, we can go for amalgam restoration. So this is how we will manage moderate MIH cases. Now, lastly, talking about how do we actually manage severe MIH. This is very difficult to treat and this is the most challenging cases that the dentist encounters in their career because patient experiences extreme sensitivity. As you can see that in this uh, cases, you can see the incisors are involved and there is some restoration which is present on first molars now. Why do we actually need such extensive restoration because this is stainless steel crowns. They are placed on all of the permanent first molars because there has increased breakdown and to prevent further breakdown, we place stainless steel crown so that the dental condition of the patient can be maintained and they can eat properly, they can chew properly and there is no further breakdown of the enamel structure. We can also go for light or chemical cured composites, we can go for RMGCI and these restoration can be used until there is full eruption of the tooth. When the tooth has completely erupted in the oral cavity, then we go for stainless steel crown. So initially when there is partial eruption of the tooth, we go for chemical or light cured composite or RMGCI. But after tooth has completely erupted in the oral cavity, then we go for stainless steel crowns. Sometimes before we actually put stainless steel crowns, there is pulpal involvement of the tooth because of increased breakdown of the tooth structure. So if tooth is restorable, then we go for root canal treatments. If the tooth is doomed to fail, like the restoration is doomed to fail, then we go for extraction and then we offer patient other uh, dental options, for example, bridge. You can go a bridge which is fixed partial denture, you can go for dental implants. But the main target is to save the natural tooth because there is no dental replacement of a natural tooth which can completely mimic the uh, function of a natural tooth. So tooth that can be saved, we go for root canal treatment. Then after root canal treatment, we put stainless steel crown but teeth which cannot be saved, we go for extraction. So this is how we'll manage a case of severe MIH and these pictures they do tell you how difficult it is to manage a case. As you can see, incisors have been involved and they have been restored. And you can see stainless steel crown placed on permanent, all permanent first molar. So this is how we'll manage a case of severe MIH. Now, lastly, talking about after we have given patient all of the uh, management options and we have actually managed such a case, what are the chances of prognosis, whether there will be um, dental structures can be maintained or not? 
because there is increased enamel breakdown so there is decreased success rate of restoration as i've already talked to you before that composite requires enamel structure so that it can bind to the tooth structure properly so when there is decreased enamel structure so the success rate of restoration decreases and that we should target to use materials that will last longer for the patient because if you use temporary restoration or restoration which are not suitable for the patient so the success rate of restoration will be decreased and lastly regular dental treatments and or regular dental visits should be planned for the patient so that the dentist knows how much the condition of the patient is progressing and whether the results are maintained or not and if there is more deterioration of the condition of already compromised patient so in this video we talked about everything that is related to mih starting up from what actually is mih then we talked about its etiological factors then we talked about what are the clinical features signs and symptoms patient presents to us how a clinical case clinical presentation is of a patient who is suffering from mih then we talked about how we can actually prevent it the grading of its severity and then we talked about management and then finally talked about what is the prognosis of a patient who is actually suffering from mih so i hope this video was useful for you and if you like this video please like share subscribe and press the bell icon thank you for watching this video see you next time